Good morning. This is Bert Gehring. Welcome to Owl Rock United Methodist Church's live worship service. If you're watching the recording, you can skip ahead to the minute mark that I'll have listed in the title. And uh, you can uh, listen to the message alone if you like. But we'd love to have you for the entire service. Stick by and watch. Scandalous. The five women of Christmas. What is Bert talking about? The five women of Christmas. Turns out it's really important as we prepare this Advent for the coming of Christ. Glad you're with us. I hope you uh, have a beautiful day, and I'm going to greet everybody here. Join us back here Wednesday at um, 6.30 p.m. for the Owl Rock Group, or join us with Gene Martino at 11 Eastern in the morning on Wednesday for his Bible study. I always join him on Zoom. Good morning, Owl Rock. I've got some announcements this morning for you, and maybe you have some for the church. Let me get, uh, no, I've got one, thank you. I can put it here. Thank you. I'll put an extra one here. Thanks. First of all, the most important announcement um, comes to you from Junior. Um, he wants to know if Patricia's new Mercedes is faster than David's. Porsche, so we will be racing to lunch today in, in Austell to see who gets there first. Only we're in my car. <laughs> oh, you could probably beat it too in that BMW, right? <laughs> uh, the second announcement is we are having lunch, our Christmas lunch right afterward. It's uh, on the house, so to speak, from uh, a benefactor, and we are happy to invite you to join us, and uh, we are going to be in, uh, up in Austell, and the name of the place is South Cobb Grill. South Cobb Grill. South Cobb. Is that what it's called? Diner. 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 South Cobb <laughs> Diner. And everyone's invited, so y'all come and join us there right after worship. Worship will end around uh, 11 o'clock, and we'll all be heading that direction. Hope you can come. Uh, uh, we are in the season of Advent where we will be preparing and remembering and celebrating the birth of Jesus. And we have our um, Advent wreath here, and we've got readers and uh, lighters for our Advent wreath this morning. And Heather's one of them. She needs that sheet of paper. She got it? She's got it on her phone. Okay, good. Um, who would have ever thought back when I started my ministry that I could send an email, whatever that is, to a layperson who would then read it off her phone. That was not going on in the late 80s, as I recall. Um, it's great. So, uh, yeah, we have the Advent wreath coming up as a part of our service today. And Heather and Paula will be doing the reading and the lighting. And um, I'll try to turn the camera that way for y'all, and then I'll turn it back. Um, so keep that in mind as when you're standing up here. If one of you could kind of stand, like over here, and then one of you back a little bit, I can see both of you from the camera, right? Okay. I'm giving directions as if I'm from Hollywood or something. I don't know what I'm doing. All right. Um, be sure and join us on Wednesdays. Uh, for the first time, we did Wednesday night Bible study live from here at the church. And I brought a little room heater because it was cold in here and I didn't want to turn on the whole air back there. So we might need to get a little heater for that room. And we're looking at whether that room was large enough. The three of us felt really cramped and cr sort of crowded around my laptop, but um, we'll work on it. I think it's nice that people can come in person if they want to. So we're going to try this. So come in person. That's at 6.30 every Wednesday right here at the church or online at the Owl Rock group on Facebook or on Zoom. And the link, link is available on the Owl Rock page and on my Burt Gary page too. And for those of you who are watching recordings, they are also on YouTube at the Burt Geary channel. That's all lowercase. B is a little lowercase, and the G is lowercase Burt Geary, with a space in the middle. Um, any other announcements this morning? Great. Will you join me in prayer? On this your day, in this your season, of this eon and age, where you have visited humanity and returned to the right hand of your Heavenly Father. We ask your blessing on this service by the power of your Holy Spirit. 
bring to our minds the remembrance and the celebration of your coming. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Our, closing, our opening hymn is It Came Upon a Midnight Clear, and that's 218 in your red United Methodist hymnal. If you would please turn to 218, stand as you were able, and let's sing together. of the Christian faith. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he arose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the weak and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. concerns list on the inside of your bulletin on the right down there at the bottom we uh, uh, we have new news I think I ourselves are going to be here but she told me that about two weeks ago she got COVID she's gotten over it she's negative she is planning to be here today 
um, along with LaSalle's. They're planning to be here, but please pray for her full recovery. Um, Scott has his surgery. I was there on Friday, and uh, he is recovering at home with physical therapy. Um, who else did I hear new information from? I think we better keep praying for Sheila. She She's missed Wednesday night Bible study. I think she's feeling pretty weak right now still. She has uh, got some sort of a, a mass with, related to her cardiopulmonary type stuff. and But it's benign at this point. They are not checking her for cancer anymore, but she's still having to wear oxygen. So please pray for her. Uh, we also add Mary Jo Hooper. Um, related to people in this church, I don't know how to tell you exactly how. No, no, how? no not a, not one of your Hoopers. No. Okay, well, who is Joe? Tell me about Mary Joe Hooper. Married to, her mother and daddy were members here for years, for years and years and years. Okay, but she married another church member who was Wayne Hooper, who is a whole different Wayne. different Hooper. And that's a different Hooper. Okay. All right, so the husband is Wayne. Okay, well, our very best. She goes by Joe? All right. Got it. Are there any other additions or changes to our prayer list? Yes, ma'am. That sounds familiar. W A D D E O L? Two D's and two X's. Who is that? You know, Judy, who sends the cards? Uh huh. It's her, I think she said her stepdaughter in law. I'm not quite sure. Stepdaughter in law? And what's going on with her? I'm not, not sure. Well, okay. All right, this is Junie's probably stepdaughter-in-law. And um, if you haven't um, met Junie, she is unable to come, um, but she, um, we always go to visit her at holidays, and she's always sending cards to people, thanking them and wishing them happy birthday or happy anniversary. She seems to collect that kind of thing, and she's so thoughtful. So prayers for Trish Waddell and others. Yes. I really miss Arlene. I don't know if you're watching Arlene, but we miss you, and we hope you get move through that pain and get to full recovery. <clears throat> Others to update or add? Yes. And I'm traveling this week. You're not going to jail or anything. You're just <laughs> you're just going on a trip. Where are you headed out? Where are you headed? Grenada. Grenada. Okay. And that's this week. Yes. Okay. You'll probably pass Patricia in the air. <laughs> All right. Others? Yes, ma'am. I just have two updates. Both mm -hmm. There they are. Do not get long COVID. Do not get it. It is, it is not advisable. Just stay negative and feel great, okay? I thank God for the vaccination. <laughs> yeah. I can see it could be worse. Yeah, for sure. But I'm all good now. I'm good, to, I'm good. I'm glad to hear it. And you got my message about lunch today? Yes. Good. I miss Paul Hall. Oh, good. Good. Thank you, Paula. Thank you, Paula. Others? I would like to add Cindy Russell back on. 
Okay. It's my daughter-in-law's mother. <clears throat> That's C I N D Y Y Russell. Mm -hmm. And her cancer has come back, <clears throat> and I think she's going on hospice. And this is your daughter-in-law. My daughter-in-law's mother. She was on there for a while. Okay, I got it. Hey, Beverly. Good morning, Mr. Presider. Yes, and now that you've walked in, um, I've got three people listed for your family. Tim, Ralph, Emma. Now, Tim passed away, is that correct? Otis. Otis passed away. I have three today. Okay, I did, so I don't have Otis on here. So I had Tim, Ralph, Emma, and I need to add Otis. Otis passed. Okay. Yeah. Family of Otis. Okay, I got it. Mm -hmm. All right, others? Will you join me in prayer? <clears throat> Lord, we lift up uh, the, the folks on our list who are recovering especially uh, Scott and Sheila, Arlene with her knee pain, Brian and Julie who are responding well to their treatment, Greg who is continuing to recover and is with us this morning, to Patricia's family all gathering down there this weekend and for worship this morning at Ebenezer. Um, we pray for um, Eyes continued full recovery and for several members of Beverly's family, Tim, Ralph, uh, Emma, and the family of Otis. We pray for uh, Trish Waddell. We pray for Cindy Russell and for Paula's travels. And we pray for Mary Jo Hooper, who has a dementia diagnosis, and for her husband, Wayne. And for everyone else on our list, Lord, we pray uh, your continued grace, blessings, and peace in their struggles, in their grief, in their recovery. And we ask in this season that you remind us of your willingness to join us in our pain to understand what human suffering is by taking it onto yourself and bearing it gladly. Not ashamed of your human form, but embracing it and redeeming it in your death and resurrection. We give thanks for all that you have done for us and we prepare for this Christmas season uh, asking you to open our hearts and our minds to new learning, to new perspective and insight to new wisdom and understanding. We pray all these things in the name of Jesus, who taught his disciples to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Lighting our candle of peace this morning, Heather and Paula are coming. Would you come at this time and I'll turn the camera and work it in. people long for peace, Isaiah declared, Comfort, O oh comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and cry to her that she has served her term, that her penalty is paid, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. 
We who gather today also seek comfort and peace, yet we are unsatisfied with ideas of peace that tell us to keep quiet and go with the flow. We long for real peace, true peace, just peace. We light these candles as signs of God crafting hope and just what? peace. May there be vacant I don't think you have to press it. calling us to repent and to live the good just pull and to the, trigger. the good news of Christ, Jesus Christ, and await and watch and labor for the day when all people can gather together to worship and glorify God. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Bear with me. Try to get it right. Thank you so much, Heather and Paula. Our next hymn is What Child Is This? That's in, uh, on 219. And you're ready, United Methodist Hymnal. Stand as you're able, and let's sing together 219.
Uh, scripture verses are on the back of your bulletin, Matthew 1, 1 through 17. On the cover, you see my title, Scandalous. The women of Christmas. And I would add the five women of Christmas. <coughs> Who are they and what am I talking about? Let's take a look at that this morning. Now at the beginning of the other Gospels, we have uh, no other Gospel that begins with a genealogy. A genealogy is what you would think it is. Those of you who have done Ancestry.com know something about genealogy. It has to do with your family tree. Who's your great-grandparents? Who's your great-great-grandparents? Who's your great-great-great-grandparents, etc. Back in biblical times, uh, they went by the man's family and name, the father. Whose father is this? And whose father is this? And whose father is this? Patriarchal culture, you can understand. And yet, very unusual. There are five women in this. They must be important. Or maybe there's some sort of message around these women that we should know. Uh, let's look. I'll read it and see what you think. An account of the genealogy of Jesus the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham was the father of Isaac, and Isaac the father of Jacob, and Jacob the father of Judah and his brothers, and Judah the father of Perez, and Zerah by Tamar. We call her Tamar. And Perez the father of Hezron, and Hezron the father of Aram, and Aram the father of Amenadab, and Amenadab the father of Nashon, and Nashon the father of Salmon, and Salmon the father of Boaz by Rahab, and Boaz the father of Obed by Ruth, and Obed the father of Jesse, and Jesse the father of King David. And King David was the father of Solomon by the wife of Uriah, that's Bathsheba, and Solomon the father of Rehoboam, and Rehoboam the father of Abiah, and Abiah the father of Asaph, and Asaph the father of Jehoshaphat, and Jehoshaphat the father of Joram, and Joram the father of Uzziah, and Uzziah the father of Jotham, and Jotham the father of Ahaz, and Ahaz the father of Hezekiah, and Hezekiah the father of Manasseh, Manasseh the father of Amos, and Amos the father of Josiah, and Josiah the father of... Do I need to take a coffee break here? <laughs> How about a water break? And Josiah, the father of Jeconiah and his brothers, and at the time of the deportation to Babylon. And after the deportation to Babylon, Je Jeconiah and the fa was the father of Salathiel, and Salathiel was the father of Zerubbabel, and Zerubbabel the father of Abiud, and Abiud the father of Eliakim, and Eliakim the father of Azor and Azor the father of Zadok, and Zadok the father of Achim, and Achim the father of Eliud, and Eliud the father of Eleazar, and Eleazar the father of Mathan, and Mathan the father of Jacob, and Jacob the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom Jesus was born, who is called the Messiah. So all the generations from Abraham to David are 14 generations, and from David to the deportation to Babylon, 14 generations, and from the deportation to Babylon to the Messiah, 14 generations. Do you know who Tamar, Rahab, Ruth, Bathsheba are? We know who Mary is. Maybe you've heard these names before. Maybe not. Got to go back to the Old Testament. Who are these women? They figure pretty prominently in the Old Testament, in a few more Old Testament stories. Now, let me tell you about Tamar. And remember, this is placed by Matthew in the genealogy of the Messiah, the Son of the living God, Jesus Christ, born of Mary and Joseph. All right? These are women in his geological tree, his family tree. Tamar was married to Judah's oldest son, heir, and then he died. And Judah, her father-in-law, gave Tamar in marriage to his next oldest son. This is called leveret marriage. 
if you marry the oldest son and he dies, you can marry her, your daughter-in-law, to the next oldest son to provide children for the oldest son. So we see that a lot in Scripture, including in the New Testament. Jesus refers to it when they ask him about res resurrection in John's Gospel. Leveret marriage. You marry the next oldest son. Now his name was Onan. <clears throat> but he refused to have children with her. He married her because his dad told him to, but he refused to have children with her. Then he died too. And Judah began to um, think Tamar was some sort of a black widow, kind of a bad luck chick, you know. And he was, he had us another son. The other son's name is Shayla. But he didn't want to give her in marriage for two reasons. One, Tamar may be poison and he'll die too. I don't want to also lose a third son to her. But this, the more important thing here is that he uses the excuse that he's just too young. Okay, so Tamar, he says to her, Tamar, if you'll just wait a few years until he's old enough to marry, then I'll give him to you in marriage. But I'm going to ask you to wait. Remain a widow until he's old enough. So she waits. When Sheila, or Shayla, became old enough to marry Tamar, Judah continued to withhold her. He refused to let him marry her, even though he was of age now forcing her to wear the widow's garment continuously, even up until now. And she got tired of waiting, and she got tired of black. She got tired of mourning and grieving, and she began to scheme. What was her plan? She took off the mourning clothes in secret. And she dressed up in bright colors like a prostitute. And she hid her face behind a veil. And she waited for Judah on a roadside that he was known to travel. When he came, she asked Judah, how much will you give me for my services? And he said, I promise you a kid from my flock. She said, where is it? He said, well, I'll go, I'll go get it. I promise I'll get it and I'll bring it back. She said, no, if you're going to do that, I need collateral now to keep until you bring me the animal. Give me your signet ring your family ring with your seal that you would put into the wax when you were mailing a letter, family ring, signet ring. Give me your signet ring and your personal staff. Everyone was recognized for their individualized staff. They would carve things in them. And everyone knew it was his. It probably had his name on it. And, um, and so he did. He gave her, his, the father-in-law Judah, gave his daughter-in-law Tamar, who he didn't know was her, dressed up like a prostitute, covered with a veil, gave her his signet ring and his staff, and they got together. And uh, after that, three months later, he heard she was pregnant from being a prostitute. And he was furious. And even though she's his daughter-in-law, she says, bring, he says, bring her to me that we shall burn her alive. So she comes. And when she arrived, Tamar announced that the father of her child, who they wanted her to identify, she said, the father of the child is the owner of this ring and staff. And she pulled out Judah's ring and Judah's staff. She's nailed him. Now he's been with a prostitute. She's pretended to be one and she's pregnant with Judah, her father-in-law's child. As it turned out, it was twins. So caught red-handed, Judah actually acts responsibly for a change. He confessed that it was true that he was the one who was in the wrong, that he shouldn't have done what he did, and that she should not die. But at that moment, he gave the son, Sheila, his youngest, to her and pledged them in marriage. She had twins, Perez and Zerah, and note that Perez and Zerah are the product of Judah and his daughter-in-law Tamar out of wedlock while she pretended to be a prostitute. That's not exactly the story you want to be told when you get onto genealogy on Ancestry.com and the first thing it says is that your father-in-law is the father of your child. That kind of messes things up, right? 
So what kind of woman is this? She's a good, good person, bad person. She certainly did something interesting. She broke several Jewish laws to do it. What kind of sinner is she? And why is she included in Jesus? I mean, shouldn't we have put maybe Sarah in the genealogy? The wife of Abraham? Or maybe Rebecca or Rachel, the wives of Isaac and Jacob? No, the first woman mentioned is Tamar, who pulled this dirty trick, had children out of wedlock, and the father was her father-in-law. Not married. Very interesting. Why is she here? You would think that later scribes would have just erased it, just to get rid of the embarrassment that he was that she was in Jesus' family tree. But no, here we again have one of the many, 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 many examples of the New Testament Gospels telling us exactly what happened, even though it put the disciples and other characters in the Bible in a negative light. They are shown as entirely human, entirely flawed, making mistakes and sinning. And here we have a genealogy full of sinners for sure, and she is definitely one of them, but why her? And why Rahab? You know who Rahab is? She's a Canaanite prostitute. She lives in Jericho. We got one woman, Tamar, pretending to be a prostitute and acting like one, and we got an actual prostitute, a Canaanite woman from Jericho. And Joshua, the general of the Israelite army, after, after um, <clears throat> Moses' death, sent two spies into Jer Jericho to measure the strength of the city and the strength of the army. How many men do they have? What are the fortifications? Can we take the city? Sends two spies in. What do the spies do the minute that they walk into the gate of Jericho? They go to a prostitute's house. Doesn't say why, but they spent the night. Somehow, the men's identities as Israelite spies were found out and recorded to the king of Jericho. And he ordered Rahab to turn in those spies immediately. But Rahab disobeyed her king, hid the Israelis under flax stalks on her roof. And then she lied to her king saying, true, two men came to me, but I didn't know they were Israelites. I didn't know who they were at all. And they fled at dark, not true still on the roof, they fled at dark. Go quickly and you can overtake them, hurry. And they went traipsing off out into the wilderness trying to find the two spies who were in Rahab's house on her roof all along. Later, when Israel attacked Jericho, Joshua spared Rahab, the harlot, and all of her family. Okay, we've got two women in the genealogy, and they're these two women? Not Sarah, Rebecca, or Rachel, not Deborah the judge, no. Tamar and Rahab. Then it gets interesting. Not as crazy interesting as that maybe, but it does get very interesting. This is a different angle. Now we have Ruth, not a prostitute. Yay! Ruth was a Moabite woman. She was a foreigner. Moab is on the other side of the Dead Sea. Moab is the country of Jordan, okay? today. Um, Ruth married, um, she was a Moabite woman and she married into an Israelite family because they had fled the family, some of the families had fled to Moab because of the big drought going on over in Israel. But then all her family died. Her husband died, Ruth's husband died, her um, mother-in-law's husband died, her father-in-law died, um, her uh, Brother-in-law died. Um, all the men in the family died, and it was just Ruth and her two uh, daughter-in-laws that were left. She said, y'all stay here. I'm too grieved to live here any longer. The, fa the famine is over. I'm going back. I'm going back to Israel. I'm going back to Judah. I'm going back home to Bethlehem, and I'm going by myself. And Ruth said, no, you are not. I'm going with you. And she said, no, you... you you and your sister, you and your sister-in-law need to go 
and go back home. You need to stay in Moab and be with your families. Just go back home to your fathers. And Ruth said no. And she said this quote, which is very famous in Ruth 1.16, where you go, Naomi, I will go. Where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people will be my people and your God, my God. And they arrived together, the two women in Bethlehem, to an uncertain future. They were impoverished. They were without male protection or provision. And they were forced to scrounge up leftovers after the gleaners got through in the fields. They allowed poor people to go out and look scrounge for whatever leftovers they can find so that they would not starve. This is a provision that is called for in Scripture. So one of those landowners where they were gleaning the left leftovers, the scraps, where Ruth and Naomi were gleaning, one of the landowners was Boaz, who was a relative of Naomi's. And he was from Bethlehem, and he took a liking to Ruth. He thought she was attractive, and he liked her and began asking questions. They began having rendezvous alone out in the fields real rendezvous, and he loved her, and they all sort of schemed together how to figure out how to properly get her married so that Boaz could bring her under his wing and care for her and be her husband and take care of Naomi too, and because he was a good man. And uh, so eventually after marrying them, you know, it was sort of a happily ever after story, but it did go through a great deal of trauma and grief, and without Boaz's rescuing them, very little hope of how things were going to go. Interesting. The next one is the wife of Uriah. This is Bathsheba. Do you know this story? Not if you know Bathsheba. Anybody know her? Okay. So King David, this is 3,000 years ago, King David is, is in his palace, which has a tower, and he's looking out over the city of Jerusalem, and he looks down, and there is a beautiful woman on a rooftop bathing. Well, he immediately falls for her. He says, who's she? And they said, well, she's married. One of your soldiers, in fact, is her husband, Uriah. He says, well, we need to get rid of Uriah. How can I get rid of Uriah? I don't want to just murder him. Okay. So put him on the front line of battle over in Amman. Yeah, put him on the front line and uh, let him fight there. And of course that meant that he was probably going to be killed. And he was, and he married Bathsheba. Now they had four sons. One of them, the youngest, was Solomon, and he succeeded King David. Ruth is the grandmother of King David. Amazing, right? That's crazy. It blows my mind. Now those are four women from the Old Testament and then we have one woman from the New Testament and that is Mary, Jesus' mother, the husband of Joseph. Now we have a problem here too and it has to do with a pregnancy. Again, it has to do with children, pregnancy, marriage. Joseph and Mary are engaged and back then engagement was like marriage. You know, you did have the ceremony, you did come together. Engagement was essentially marriage, but it was not consummated until after a certain period of time when they had the ceremony. So, Mary tells Joseph, look, um, I got to tell you something. I haven't done anything wrong. I have not been with a man. And you know, I haven't been with you, but I'm pregnant by the Holy Spirit. An angel visited me named Gabriel, and he told me that I'm going to have a baby. And guess what? Joseph believed her. Not, he didn't believe her. And he resolved that evening, the evening that she told him, he resolved to divorce her quietly because he didn't want her to be put to death or to be put to shame for breaking the laws of Moses and having a uh, an out-of-wedlock affair. Remember, uh, who was going to get burned at the stake in the earlier story? Tamar. Judah was going to burn her at the stake for what she did pretending to be a harlot and getting pregnant. 
It was, uh, it says in Leviticus that you should stone people who have extramarital or who have uh, premarital uh, relations. You're supposed to stone them. You could do that legally. Joseph did not want to do that. He was going to put her away quietly and let Mary's problem be Mary's problem and let the pregnancy be her family's problem, not his. He is assuming that she's lying. Well, who did lie? Well, Tamar lied. Rahab uh, lied to the king twice. Ruth and Naomi and Boaz schemed to make that situation work. They weren't exactly being above board. And, of course, the secret of David was that he sent his soldier Uriah into battle to the front line to be killed so he could steal his wife from her, from him. Her name was Bathsheba. So you get the picture. What's Matthew telling us? And this, these, this is kind, these, it's kind of scandalous to see these four women in here with Mary, who we think of as a teenager, rather blameless and righteous and good, who doesn't lie, who tells her husband the truth, even though he doesn't believe her at first. I mean, she's a woman of, obviously, though young, of character and honesty. And <clears throat> yet, here she is in the company of Tamar and Rahab, whose character is highly questionable, and Ruth, who wasn't above scheming somewhat with Boaz and Naomi to work something out to get her hooked up, married. Wow. Why? What is Matthew telling us? We haven't even gotten to the birth story. It comes next. This is the setup for the birth of Jesus in Matthew's gospel. And, and he hurries past the birth to two years later when the, the Magi or Magi visit when Jesus is two years old. And they find Jesus in the house in Bethlehem where they live. If they don't live in Bethlehem, why are they still in the house two years later? It's very interesting. So Matthew goes directly from Here's a genealogy that's got five women in it, four of whom are, at least three of whom are questionable and one sort of, and they're in there with Mary. Why? Why these women? Well, I think Matthew would, I don't know what he'd say. I think maybe he'd probably say, I'm just telling the truth. But he could have listed all the moms. He only listed these moms. These are women in Jesus' family tree. And he lists not all of them, but the ones that you wouldn't expect, maybe. At least in the case of the first four. Why? I have found um, in the Gospels that honesty is important. And the gospel has a priority of inclusion. Now, by inclusion, I don't want you to read modern definitions into that. By inclusion, um, I don't mean something like inclusive language or inclusive politics or anything like that. What I'm talking about is God's saving work for everyone, all people. All are saved especially those, uh, I believe it was Peter who wrote, especially those of us who are being saved, those of us who know the Lord. All are saved on the cross, but especially those of us who follow him. Um, this is a gift, this salvation is a gift to all. That inclusiveness of all people in salvation is critical to the gospel and it's obviously critical to Matthew. Because he wants to make sure that you understand that included in Jesus' genealogy were sinners just like you and me. And some of them are worse and some of them are women. And some of them weren't married and had children out of wedlock. And one was a prostitute and one pretended and acted like one. There is room in Christmas for sinners. No matter how scandalous it may look, when you look at them individually, 
Yeah, it looks scandalous for these particular women to be there, with the exception of maybe Ruth and certainly Mary. But what's Matthew telling us? He's telling us that one who has no sin, Jesus Christ, has come into the world with a, with a body of sin, with a heart of sin, where Jesus said all human sin, come, where evil comes from. All evil comes from the human heart. And yet he's got one. So Jesus goes down deep into humanity by, coming, by becoming human in the flesh, just like us, with the same brain, the same heart, and the same sinful inclination that is tempting him 24-7. Well, at least when he's awake. He takes naps, you know. Jesus sleeps. He had diapers when he was a baby. This is a human being. Now, what did it mean when the shepherds said in Luke's gospel, peace on earth and goodwill to all men with whom God is well pleased? Jesus is a gift to the world. And the world is a broken place, full of broken people, full of sinners who are broken. Who is to say that Tamar is any worse sinner than any of the rest of us? For Jesus said, if you think about adultery with someone, you are guilty of adultery. And the disciples must have surely said to him, well, that means we're all guilty of adultery. And Jesus probably said, you're welcome. Exactly. No one is not guilty. No one is righteous. No, not one. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And Tamar did so pretty spectacularly. Rahab did so pretty spectacularly. Ruth made a few mistakes. And we know what happened with Bathsheba, although she herself did end up marrying the king. How could she have said no? On the other hand, if she knew that her husband had been killed on the front line by his hand, which she probably did, then she was complacent in it. Why are these guilty, complacent sinners in the genealogy? Because everybody in the genealogy, whether blessed as a, as a descendant of Jesus or not, whether a king of Israel or not, were all sinners and all included. This is an inclusive act of God in Christ becoming human. Now, Mary was a part of that. And we don't have any information here with which to find fault in Mary, especially early on in the Gospels. But later on, we see Mary's humanity. It says that she and Jesus' brothers and sisters didn't believe in him. During his ministry, they were so concerned about him up in Nazareth that they all traveled together down to Capernaum, for they'd heard he'd gone out of his mind. And they were beginning to think that was true. And they thought, well, we're going to do an intervention and we're going to go down to Capernaum and we're going to knock on his door and we're going to save him from himself. So they went to rescue Jesus from his own mental illness. Wow. Could she have been more wrong? Why is she doing this? How could she feel this way? How could she believe this after all she learned from the angel? After all the Lord had done for her, after all she had seen, she wasn't sure because she was human. A sinner and frail and flawed and inexperienced as she was, she was still, and that's, I guess, the definition of being a human teenage female, even in the first century. So the Gospels tell us the truth. Sinners are in the gene genealogy tree. The Gospels tell us the truth. Women are in the tree, and they're often not named at all, usually not named at all. And the Gospels tell us the truth about these women, all who are famous for being rather infamous, with the exception of perhaps Ruth and certainly Mary. But they're included. Remember what I said last week about communion? Communion was first given on the night that Jesus was betrayed. And he was at table with them reclining. And sitting next to Jesus, sharing the same bowl of sop that he was dipping in, was Judas. Sitting in the seat of the guest of honor to the left, and John seated to the right probably, 
as his closest helper, confidant, and friend. That's the way John portrays it anyway. Peter is seen in that role in the other Gospels more often. And there they are sitting together, John on one side and Judas on the other. And Jesus twice calls him a friend, Judas. He picked him, he taught him for years, and on the night that that man betrayed him, he still called him friend. Maybe we should rethink who we exclude from the church. Maybe we should rethink who we exclude from our families. Maybe we should rethink who we judge. For he came to earth to save sinners, and that's what we are, all of us, all guilty, all in need of redemption, of salvation. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our closing hymn is O Come, O Come, Emmanuel, page 211 in the red hymnal. Let's stand together as you're able and sing 211. able to keep you from falling and to bring you faultless and joyful before his glorious presence. To the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, might, and authority from all ages past and now and forever and ever. Amen. Amen. See you at lunch. Is everybody